Offence Archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrible. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him, for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want. Talk Radio. The Tice Man cometh. Stir up your Sundays with Richard Tice. From global current affairs to the issues that hit closer to home. Richard Tice. On Talk Radio. And a very good morning to one and all. Welcome to Tice Talk here on Talk Radio on Sunday the 6th of March. And as I look out from Talk Radio Towers, the sky is relatively clear and bright here in London, but of course the news is bleak and grim in Central Europe, in Ukraine, and of course throughout the show we're going to be talking about that lots, looking at the horrors, the appalling scenes. We'll be talking to people in Ukraine, understanding the humanitarian crisis and what more we can do and should do. We'll also be looking at, uh, in a sense, what's going on further east from Ukraine, in China, how are they responding to this crisis and the implications that has for all of our futures? And then I'm going to be talking about shale gas, the pros and the cons, as a new campaign for a referendum on the issue of net zero is launched today. And I'm very much involved with that. We're going to be talking about energy prices, fuel prices. The reasons for inflation includes soaring shipping cross costs across the world. I'm also going to talk about Crossrail. Do you remember that? Will it ever, ever open? And yes, we've got to go to Scotland to talk about the gender wars. That and much, much more. We've got some amazing guests. We've got MPs from the UK and from Ukraine. We've got senior fellows, experts. And my big questions for all of you. Do you want a referendum on net zero? And what more do you think we can do and should do and must do on Ukraine? And your views matter. It makes for a better show. So give us a call 0344 499 1000 or text us 87222 using the word talk or tweet at Talk Radio. And of course, if you want to, you can use uh, the Talk Radio TV on the website, download the app. Uh, you can watch us on YouTube, Apple TV, Samsung. There's no excuse not to watch if you want to or just listen. Stay with us for three hours of Tice Talk here at Talk Radio. Richard Tice on Talk Radio. Well, a very good morning to you. It's Sunday the 6th of March. It's just after 10 o'clock. And yes, it's time for my Sunday sermon. And from my pulpit, it seems to me that matters in Ukraine are going, in a sense, as we feared, from bad to worse. Casualties are mounting on all sides. Death, destruction on a city-by-city city scale, something we've never seen in our lifetimes, for most of us, something we've never seen since the Second World War. The humanitarian crisis. Breaking news this morning suggests that some one and a half million women and children have already fled Ukraine. What will that number rise to over the coming weeks? We're only 10 days or so into this crisis. Already one and a half million. It could be four million. It could be five million or even more. And amongst all of this horror, this immediate appalling scenes, I just want to take a step back and see what's the bigger picture here. And last week I spoke about the sanctions, countries pulling together after a slow start, the EU, the US, the UK. And actually those sanctions are having, without question, an early impact on the oligarchs and on the Russian people. And I said they would also actually have an impact on us in the West. But in a sense, everybody's having to suffer short-term pain for hopefully medium-term gain. But it seems that others, well, they're not actually doing the right thing. They're not condemning Russia. They're not condemning Putin and his terrible 
regime. Now, let's look at what the Chinese regime are saying. Because actually, it turns out that they're sitting on the fence. So there was a UN resolution this week asking for Putin's forces to withdraw from the uh, from Ukraine. What did China do? It abstained. Why, you might ask? 35 countries in total abstained. And I think that tells us a story. And if you look at the list of abstentions, many of them, of course, are actually recipients, beneficiaries of the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. And if I just read out some of the countries, Algeria, Angola, the Central African Republic, Congo, Sudan, South Sudan. But what about this one? South Africa? Sri Lanka, Senegal, Tanzania, Zimbabwe. But hang on, what about India? What about Pakistan? I mean, these are two of the six Commonwealth countries who abstained. Should we still be sending foreign aid to countries like that if they're not prepared to stand up to Russia? Now, the US is considering sanctions against some of them, but of course there's always other reasons. For example, India has recently done big defence deals on jets and missile systems with Russia. Pakistan, just in the last two weeks, Imran Khan, he's been in Russia doing a deal on wheat and natural gas. But let's also look at how the Chinese regime, and I'm going to be talking about this later, about how they are actually suppressing information from their own public. So much so that actually their deputy leader, Li Ka-shung, at the annual Congress, the annual People's Congress meeting this week, in an hour-long speech, no mention whatsoever of what's going on in Central Europe, in Ukraine, the war, or Russia. The opening speech in the Paralympics in Beijing by the leader, Andrew Parsons, the boss of the Paralympics, his comments about seeking peace were deliberately censored by the Chinese regime. And then UK Premier League football matches, always eagerly awaited by people in China who love football, actually Many of the matches have been pulled from the TV screens. Why? Because the players and the fans here in the UK expressed support for Ukraine. And I'm saying to you, we need to understand this. We need to understand the reasons why, what their agenda is. When I first started presenting back in August last year, we were plunged into the Afghanistan crisis. And I said then that in the space of a couple of weeks, the world order was changing in front of our eyes. And of course, that was true then, but even more so now. The events of the last two weeks massively reinforce this. There is descending upon the world an axis of communist evil involving China and Russia, what I call the regimes of Chaisha, that is splitting the world, separating parts of East and West. Now, I think we've got to impose more sanctions, tougher sanctions, faster, because essentially at the moment, apart from sending weapons to the Ukrainian, Ukrainian military forces, this is the main weapon that we're using. And we have to be prepared to be in for the long haul. But I think we also have to send a message to the Chinese regime that if they take over or invade Taiwan, against their will, then actually the West needs to apply exactly the same tough, tough sanctions on the Chinese regime. And we need to prepare for this. Businesses, all of us, consumers, need to understand the risks. Because we've been duped into believing that all was sweetness and light. But actually, far from it. Both of these regimes involve authoritarian bullies who don't respect freedoms, they don't respect individual rights, and in some cases, they're clearly committing genocide. Putin is a bully who's using the gun to expand and control. 
Whereas China, of course, is a bully that is mainly, mainly using economic means and a suppression of freedom to expand and control. And we have to stand up to this. We have to be more independent. In particular, we have to be more self-reliant on energy, which is so critical, affordable energy, to everything about the way that we live. We have to invest much, much more in defence of our country and our strategic interests. And I'll be talking more about this straight afterward, after the break, when I talk to Tobias Elwood. But for the moment, here on this Sunday, yet another difficult week, another difficult weekend, tough news. Here endeth my Sunday sermon. Give us a call with your views. What should we be doing about Ukraine? 0344 499 1000. Text me, tweet me. I want to hear from you. Do you want a referendum on net zero, a proper debate on this, rather than being labelled a sceptic or a denier? Stay with us. Coming up, as I say, it's Tobias Elwood, MP, to talk about what's going on in Ukraine, what more we can do. It's Tice Talk on Talk Radio. Talk. Bold talk. talk Radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him, for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
Talk Radio. Standing up for the little guy. Full contact, common sense conversation. Smart speaker, smart TV. We're on your side. Powered by Common Sense. Talk Radio. Welcome back to Ty's Talk here on Talk Radio. The messages are already coming in. Adrian in Daventry, he says, Richard, the countries that abstained in that UN resolution and who do not condemn Russia are weak cowards. Well, I agree with you, Adrian. And we need to really put maximum pressure on them. And my next guest, my first guest this morning, is someone who has actually been talking about pressure and strength and being robust. Tobias Elwood is the Conservative MP for Bournemouth East and chair of the House of Commons Defence Select Committee and has been talking strongly about the need for us to be really robust with our defence standing up to Putin. Tobias, a very good morning to you. There's breaking news, Tobias, that there may be another attempt at a ceasefire in Mariupol after the failure yesterday. I guess, you know, we're just going to be faced with these horrors day after day after day. It, it's heart-wrenching. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, the the progress of events? Is, is, is this sort of how you expected it? Uh, and what do you expect over the coming week or so? Uh, yes, it's tragic to see this is still going on uh, into a second week. Uh, I think the wider picture is uh, the good news. Putin's days are numbered. I think I can say that with some confidence. The Russian elites, the senior military, know that the scale of sanctions that we've put in, including, I would say, huge effort by the UK to encourage this, means that there's no return to the international community if Putin remains in charge. So they know that eventually they've got to get rid of him. And the Kremlin does this periodically in their uh, history. Otherwise, their economy will never recover. The concern is what damage could Putin then inflict until that moment? And that's the race against the clock, because we need to support Ukraine as best as, as we can. Uh, and there is a chance that they can survive this, you know, if Putin goes before uh, he's able to inflict such mayhem but what we've seen, and you've just touched on it yourself, is um, what. So I lost you there for a second. What we've seen uh, is uh, how initially, when he did his invasion, it didn't go according to plan. Uh, so he's gone back to old doctrine of pummeling the cities from afar with his uh, artillery. He quickly recognized our own red lines, the willingness or the, uh, the lack of appetite, if you like, for us to actually uh, step in in any form. And that's why we're seeing some very ugly tactics, uh, committing war crimes, attacks on nuclear power stations and breaching of ceasefires. Long and, answer, but tomorrow and, and, but, but, today's ceasefire could easily be breached. I could expect that to happen. It's a very dangerous situation there. Uh, of course. And in a sense, uh, clearly, it, it does look like the Russian forces and columns, uh, they appear to be struggling. We obviously have to be slightly careful with the information we see and hear. But it, it does appear that they're getting more resistance from the incredibly brave uh, Ukrainian, Ukrainian uh, forces and indeed population. Uh, do you, are you surprised by how the Russian forces have been performing? Is it worse than you expected? It is far worse. I mean, they, I think we built an image after 2014. The Russians regrouped, they uh, re-kitted, uh, they changed their protocols and doctrines. We, there was this assumption that they were a far more capable fighting machine, but we've seen the logistical supply chains fail. We've seen tanks just run out of fuel and columns just uh, li uh, you know, lining up there. I'm amazed that we've not done more to take those long 40-mile columns of tanks out because they are sitting ducks, but I hope somebody will be focusing on that. But ultimately, yes, it's been quite surprising. Unfortunately, as, as Stalin, I think, made uh, the comment, there is a, a quality to quantity in its own right. If you simply have, you know, far superior numbers that you can keep throwing at and you don't care if your own people die, well, then it's going to become very, very difficult indeed. And that takes you back to the point as to what we, the international community, can do to support Ukraine before I hope we see Putin removed. And that, I'm afraid, will require us to move to away from peacetime decision-making mode you know, to recognise this is war in Europe, we require a different stance, a different That's right, because... character of statecraft. You need to get back into that, you know, Cold War mentality. And President Zelensky clearly under massive pressure, which, you know, we understand. Um, you know, he he's sort of expressing his frustration with us in the West that, in a sense, 
Uh, he feels we're not doing enough. Um, I think he might have used the word, you know, we're betraying Ukraine. And, and we understand, uh, you know, his his desperate desire uh, to get more of a... Are we doing enough in terms of selling, sending enough equipment, uh, the anti-tank uh, missiles, uh, anti-air uh, missiles as well? Do you think that's actually happening fast enough, Tobias? It's certainly moving into a far greater place. The Americans are putting more of an effort into it. And again, acknowledge what uh, the Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, has done. We're one of the very first to start providing weapon systems before the invasion uh, was uh, actually took place. And absolutely right to pay tribute to Zelensky. He's come from being, you know, a comedian a few years ago to being what a wartime leader. I mean, quite incredible to rally his nation. And perhaps that's also the surprising um, uh, sort of uh, reaction that we've seen here is a country, I saw this when I visited Ukraine, a real passion to defend their country, to stand up against huge adversity and say, we're going to fight. People who've never gotten any fighting experience before, never been in the armed forces, never wore a uniform, and they're willing to stay the ground and stand up to the Russians. So we have a, a duty here. Uh, we actually have a legal duty because 1994, we signed that uh, Budapest uh, a memorandum which actually said we would support their security so we need to look at how we can do more it will require us i'm afraid to lean into this because putin won't stop no. until he stopped and until and, that penny drops it's going to get very dangerous indeed and i think that's the point i mean in a sense i'm with you i think the only way this ends is when is when basically putin is removed from power but we just we have no idea how long uh, that will take and and how tough things need to get in Russia for the people or the uh, the Russian leaders generals uh, to rise up against him but in the meantime I mean how concerned are you despite what we're seeing of the Russian forces struggling in Ukraine how concerned are you that if he wins in Ukraine that then he might continue uh, for example to the Baltic states yes it'll probably be Moldova that will be on his uh, horizons next, potentially Georgia as well. There'll be other places in the Arctic that he could be looking at. You know, it's likely that he'll go for non-NATO countries because we made it very, very clear that seems to be our red lines. But we have adopted this attitude that we believe he is untouchable because he threatens to deploy his tactical nuclear uh, weapons and therefore he will keep going. Our inaction, if you like, and in, in even testing where the line is, you know, before he incrementally ratchets things up, means that uh, it emboldens uh, Putin. Put it into clarity, the US nuclear threat level has remains absolutely unchanged. There are many methods in which this is uh, managed and monitored, many indicators that tell us whether there is a genuine threat or not, or this is just Putin's talk. Clearly, you've got to take it seriously. This is a nuclear power, but like the Cuban Missile Crisis, what point do we then recognize that we must stand up, or as you imply, he will advance further. He is on a mission to push back and regain all the old Warsaw Pact countries that have now joined NATO, particularly the Slavic uh, so, uh, areas so too. Anybody who thinks that he's going to stop at Ukraine essentially uh, is being naive. Uh, I, I guess the real question, though, is, is whether his forces uh, are up to it, uh, whether he really has got the equipment and the troops that are, that are capable of going further. Well, he, he does have the equipment. They've not been utilised well, he's not used his, his air power, his superior air power in any sense of the imagination, um, nor has he um, utilised all his uh, ground forces either. What he's done is retreated back and then tried to introduce this element of fear by pummeling uh, the cities, forcing mass evacuations, therefore removing many of the, uh, the civilian populations, including some of the workforce as well. He's causing confusion, causing mayhem, wanting to place pressure. So uh, Ukraine actually backs down. And, and, and of course, we absolutely shouldn't uh, underestimate him in any way. It's, it's quite possible, of course, he could be there for years and years, which leads, there's quite a lot of discussion uh, amongst various commentators and I think amongst uh, Tory MPs about increasing the size of our defence budget, increasing rearming. Obviously, we've seen Germany's welcome commitment to spending a lot more on defence. How realistic is that, uh, given all the pressures, budgetary pressures, and how hard are you pushing for that, Tobias? Well, I know that the MOD has been actually agreeing privately with my call to move to 3%. I've been saying this for over a year. Prior to even this invasion, we can see that our world was getting more dangerous, more complex, the threats getting more dynamic, more unpredictable. And here is a great 
uh, example. Our budget stayed the same, peacetime budget about 2%, but threats advanced into cyber and space. We've invested in those areas, but to the detriment of our three conventional forces. We've cut back on the speed in which we're replacing ships. We've cut back on F-35s, can you believe it? We've yeah. come back, uh, cut back on troops, 10,000 troops and tanks, uh, armored fighting vehicles, even the Hercules aircraft. Brilliant, but the SAS uh, use is now being removed. I hope now there's this wake-up call, not from the MOD, they get it, but it has to be the Treasury. Number 10, recognize we need to move to 3% GDP defense spend. Um, Tobias, thank you so much for those thoughts. Uh, that's Tobias Elwood, the Conservative MP for Bournemouth East, chair of the Defence Select Committee, uh, with his views and his clear demand, essentially, that the UK moves to spend a lot more on defence, given everything that is going on. And uh, I, I actually agree with him. We have got to spend more on defence, but there are huge pressures on uh, all the budget, of course. Taxes are going up. Growth is slipping. And that's why, actually, we need also to look at how do we how do we improve growth? How do we get faster growth? Well, one of the ways is to have cheaper energy costs. And I'm going to be talking this morning about, uh, essentially, the need to use the treasure under our feet, shale gas, the pros and cons, and also the new campaign that's launched that I'm involved in for a referendum, a national debate on net zero. Imagine if we had much, much lower energy costs but have a fear for if actually the costs of net zero were to lead to much higher, higher energy costs. Stay with us. Coming up, we're going to be talking to Rupert Darwell after the break. It's Ty's Talk on Talk Radio. Talk. Bold talk. talk Radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him, for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want. Tice on Talk Radio. World headquarters of Common Sense. Talk Radio. Listen on DAB+. Watch it live on your smart TV. Richard Tice. Talk Radio. Welcome back to Tice Talk. We're in the first hour. We've just been talking to Tobias Elwood, the MP about uh, Ukraine, about the need to improve our defence spending. 
but also uh, domestically, we need to uh, have a much better understanding of, of the big strategic risks, one of which, of course, is the cost of energy. I mean, gas prices, wholesale gas prices, are nine times higher than they were just a year ago. And we're just at the foothills of the cost of net zero. And that's why I'm campaigning, joining a campaign that we need to have a proper national debate and a referendum on the government's net zero plans because there's other ways to be smarter about how we actually reduce emissions. And I think that's absolutely vital. And I'm delighted now to be joined by Rupert Darwell, who's the senior fellow of the Real Clear, Real, Real Clear Foundation and author of Green Tyranny to talk further about this. Uh, good morning to you, Rupert. Thanks for joining us on Ties Talk this Sunday morning. Well, um, you know, we can see it for all to see, can't we? Record uh, fuel prices at the petrol pumps, diesel prices. Uh, we're just approaching April where uh, people's uh, heating bills, energy bills are going to be soaring. And there's talk even that far from being £2,000, give or take, in April, by October they could be £3,000. Um, what, what are your views uh, on this, uh, Rupert, and how, in a sense, how are we going to stop it, this relentless increase in costs? Well, you just had um, on the news break, you, you were quoting Dominic Raab talking about strategic stamina. And what we're not seeing when it comes to energy is any strategic stamina from ministers at all. Uh, you mentioned um, shale, gas and fracking. Uh, Francis Egan, who's the CEO of Quadrilla and who was allowed to do two, just two fracking wells, uh, exploratory ones, wrote the other day to the Telegraph, estimated there's 3.3 trillion of recoverable um 3.3 trillion pounds worth of recoverable ga gas reserves across the northwest and ministers instead of saying let's get fracking they're saying pour concrete down those two wells so we can't frack i mean it is it is the definition of insanity it, it really is and you know that's why i'm involved in this campaign we've got to have a debate about the costs of net zero and we've got to have a grown-up debate about shale gas what i call the treasure that's under our feet as you say the value is i mean give or take it's the value of our national debt it's like having uh, it's like having treasure under your floorboards in your house uh, that's to the value of the mortgage on your house and yet we've got the business secretary quasi quarting this morning saying that actually the problem is gas expensive gas well why is it expensive quasi he's saying we need more renewables what's your answer to that he wants more wind he, he thinks that's the solution even when the wind doesn't blow well, it, it, as you as you just indicated, it's not a solution at all. It is it, it if you the more renewables that you have, you end up burning more gas because that's how you balance the grid. And of course, that's before you get to the whole question of how how do you heat Britain? Britain says how do you make fertilizer without without natural gas? I mean, it just it goes it ripples through the whole supply chain. But there's another point, Richard, which we should be talking about, which is British jobs. The um, the highest productivity area, city area outside London is Aberdeen. In terms of the way the st statisticians me measure it, it's gross value add per head is Aberdeen. Why is that? That's North Sea oil. If you want really good paying jobs, the way to do them is, is through fracking. I've, I visited um, a fracking site in Colorado last year. What, a, a guy working there in his first year was earning $75,000 a year. I mean, this, this is, we're talking about big money, not just big money for the Treasury, but big money in people's pockets, big money for, for regions that should be levelling up. And that's why we've got to have a proper debate on this. And just whilst we've been uh, speaking, Rupert, you know, I've got a, uh, a tweet in here that says, my bill has become so unbearable this week, I've asked my energy to come company to come out and cap my gas. I can't afford to pay it. I've stocked up on draft excluders and hot water bottles. I mean, we're going back into the Stone Age, not going forwards. It's utterly unbelievable in the 21st century. There's a lot of, um, in a sense, sort of myths around the ways of extracting shale gas, Rupert. I mean, fracking is just one of a number of methods. Um, there was a very, very successful campaign essentially to sort of uh, to uh, discredit it. But there are other new technologies. And my view is that we should be a world leader in investing in the new emerging technologies to extract it, the maybe even more efficient uh, and faster 
than using fracking. I mean, that's the opportunity. Some say that the Boland shale, uh, the, the shale gas in the north of England could be way more prolific than what they see in America. Yeah, it is. The Boland shale formation is is a similar size to the Marcellus in the US and the Permian in the US. And so, yes, there's a, there's a huge amount. I mean, the geologists indicate that there's a huge amount of natural gas there, which which we can get. But one thing we should remember is that the Greens and indeed ministers are on the same page as Vladimir Putin on this, who at a business conference in Moscow a couple of years ago called frac fracking barbaric. You know, this is out of, uh, and here we are. We're just not listening to what Putin. If Putin is telling us fracking is barbaric, you should really look at it and say, why is he saying it's barbaric? Because he wants Western Europe to remain dependent on Gazprom and Russian gas. Exactly, and actually, there have been, you know, really very serious allegations in the Guardian and in the Daily Mail in recent years that actually maybe Russia was behind the very well organised, very well funded campaigns. Uh, against shale gas extraction, not just here in the UK, but also elsewhere across Europe, uh, because they realised that actually, uh, if we didn't uh, use our own shale gas treasure, then we'd all become dependent on Russian gas. And in a sense, they succeeded, and now we're suffering the pain. And now they're saying, and now they're saying the problem is natural gas. The problem is not natural gas. It is Russian natural gas. And if you turn off the supply of Western uh, sources, you will you will have to depend more on the a the price goes higher and b you're depending more on Gazprom. We should actually take a book out of the Norwegians' book, um, what the new Norwegian socialist prime minister said to the Financial Times the other day when he uh, just after he got elected, he said, "Well, if you want to have an energy transition, you need to have natural gas because how are you going to make all the wind farms without without energy?" They're very energy intensive to make. But there has been a massive amount of misinformation. Another uh, tweet that's just come in from Martin, uh, he says um, uh, fracking in the Boland Shale will not work. And I think that's the point, is that the, the other side, uh, they've won the argument to date, and that's why, uh, you know, we've really got to get going and really uh, insist that we have this national debate because the net zero plans and the cost of it is hugely linked to and related to the solution, which I'm crystal clear, is uh, being a world leader in the best technologies to extract this treasure from under our feet. That, that's absolutely right. And what I find very odd is that the critics say, they say things like, oh, it won't it won't move the dial on, on, on prices. Oh, there's not very much of it. Well, just let people, you know, let the private sector find the best way of getting and the most environmentally sound way of getting this gas out of the ground um, and get it into into international grid and pipe through pipe through into people's homes. That's the way to do it. Um, there's, there's no doubt at all. Well, uh, Rupert, we're going to be engaged in this debate for many months and I suspect and fear years to come. Uh, that's Rupert Darwell, senior fellow of the Real Clear Foundation, author of Green Tyranny. Uh, he is uh, he is pro. Uh, using our shale gas. He believes that we can dramatically reduce our energy prices, and that's what we should do. And, you know, when you see the messages coming in about the cost of energy and the fact that whilst we're facing the increase in bills in April, they could increase by 30, 40, 50% again this October. I mean, it's completely unbelievable. Give us a call, 0344 499 1000, with your views, your thoughts about this. Interesting question here from Stephen, uh, who says, uh, UK farmers say we've only got 50 more harvests. Are you sure gas is more important than food? Well, I don't think we've only got 50 more harvests. Uh, I think that, again, is misinformation. But actually, affordable energy is so critical for all businesses to be able to produce things and for us to become much much more self-reliant. 0344 499 1000. But coming up, there's a different view about shale gas. And after the break, I'll be talking to uh, Dr David Toke, who's got some alternative views on shale gas extraction. Stay with us. It's Ty's Talk here on Talk Radio. Talk. Bold talk. talk Radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk Radio. 
Offence Archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him, for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want. The UK's official opinion exchange. Captivating. Campaigning. Controversial. Reach for the story. Radio with grown-up opinions. Don't get angry. Get on talk radio. The home of common sense. Welcome back to Ty's Talk. We are cruising through the first hour of the show. We've got lots coming up in the second hour. We'll be going to Ukraine to talk to a Ukrainian MP about what's going on. And we'll also be talking about the risk in China, what's going on. Uh, with their views, why they're suppressing information. But I've been talking about shale gas, about energy. We've got lots of tweets and messages coming in. Dr Jazz says, having all the gas under our feet and not using it is akin to having a full bank account and starving yourself. It's outright stupidity, if you ask me. Well, maybe, you know, there's always two sides to a debate, to an issue, and that's why, actually, we need to have that debate out in the open. That's what we do at Talk Radio. You know, we can disagree with each other, but do it in a sensible, amicable, agreeable way. And it's all important to understand 
uh, the different reasons why people might have that different view. I, for example, have clearly laid out why I think we should be looking to extract safely and sensibly shale gas. But my next guest, uh, I think, is going to put forward uh, some, uh, you know, some important other aspects to the debate. Dr. David Toke is a uh, a reader in energy politics at the University of Aberdeen and joins me now. Uh, Dr. Toke, a very good morning to you. Thank you for joining Ty's talk. So. Uh, there's obviously, uh, you know, this big, uh, hugely uh, concerning issue for all of us with our increasing energy bills up and down the country. Um, they're going up in April, then potentially later on in the year. And what I'm saying is we've got this treasure under our feet called shale gas. It's owned by all of us. Um, we should be using it. We should be extracting it rather than leaving it hidden under the floorboards. What's your view? Well, somebody just as you said wrote in saying that we ought to use our bank account to buy this stuff but that's more akin to sort of opening up your bank account to scammers if you uh, or, or spending it on expensive heroin what we need to be doing is reducing our gas consumption rather than getting us mainlined further, dependent on supplies of very expensive gas. This is going to be sold at very expensive prices, very good for the shale gas producers, no, no doubt. But we need to replace gas consumption with much cheaper renewable energy and energy efficiency. Now, people are talking about getting rid of some planning requirements for, uh, for some planning rules for shale gas. But look, onshore wind in England is effectively banned. We should, instead of using land for shale gas, we should use it for onshore wind and get rid of these bans that the government Im imposed a, a, a few years ago. And it would be much cheaper. Look, but, but the you, onshore you, okay. wind can be given contracts at about fifty pounds per David, megawatt hour. David, the what shale happens? gas, the electricity from shale gas, costs about two hundred pounds per megawatt hour. There's just no contest. What happens when the wind doesn't blow, David? Do we do we live in the dark? Do we put the candles on? Uh, we the, there are lots of alternatives at the moment, such as and. Uh, Look, we can have a long discussion about storage, if you like, and what we do when we get to a point where there's very little available to uh, take account of the situations you, 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 you talk about. But the fact is that since we ha we've had now about 30% of our electricity from wind power, more if you include solar power and other uh, sources, and the amount of fossil fuels we have... Uh, had reduced, uh, we've been consuming has been reduced by exactly the same amount. More wind power equals less gas now. That's a, quite a simple equation. Let's not get distracted. Uh, look, that's fine when the wind blows, but you can't, we, we can't store uh, the energy from uh, the turbines. And we've got this situation where we're paying huge subsidies. We sometimes have to pay the uh, the investors of these wind turbines, we have to pay them to turn the turbines off if there's not enough demand or if they're long is. But hear me out. Look, we all want to reduce emissions, David, and, and I'm with you that different technologies will emerge over the next 20, 30, 40 years, um, whether it's nuclear, whether it's hydrogen, fantastic. But in the interim, David, we've only got gas as the cheap, reliable, and you say it's expensive, but hang on. All of the shale gas... It's owned by all of us. It's not owned by the producers. It's owned by all of us. And why is it that in America, when they're extracting shale gas, their gas prices are but a fraction of ours? Is that a coincidence? No, it isn't. And America's completely different. And they've got a lot more natural gas resources of various types compared to demand. They're not dependent on the world liquefied natural gas market as we are, they're not in a globalised market. They they just have a domestic, sealed off uh, m market in effect. So the economics and prices are completely different. But if they can do it, if they, no, look, if they look, can do look, it, why look, can't look, we? It's quite simple. Look, we need more, more wind power, more renewables, and also a lot more energy efficiency. There's an awful lot of very rapid energy efficient uh, 
measures that we ought to be taken that will reduce uh, gas consumption very cheaply. And I'm sorry, whatever you say, the government issues fixed price contracts for wind power uh, that will only get paid at 50 pounds per megawatt hour. And electricity from gas costs at the moment around two hundred pounds per megawatt hour. There's just no, there's just no contacts. Uh, contacts now. Now, Richard, can you subtract uh, fifty pounds per megawatt hour from two hundred pounds per megawatt hour? What do you get uh, as a saving? Uh, David, the reason that the gas price is high is because we're dependent on importing other gas. If America can use their gas domestically and have prices a fraction of ours, guess what, David? We can do exactly the same. We can no, we keep, can't. Because we can. We're, we're, not ex we're, we're in a globalised energy market. This has been our policy now for 30 then, years. Then change the policy, uh, you're David. You're going to get out of that very easily. Uh, and even if you did... Uh, uh, you, you'd still have enormous costs in, in trying to replace this gas supply. Much better uh, with gas. Much better, m much better would be uh, would be to replace it with renewable energy and energy efficiency. I mean, at the moment, I'm organising a campaign to try and get the government to insist that all new buildings have solar photovoltaics on them. And that's a simple measure. That's the sort of measure we ought to be taking David, and getting rid of these restrictions on onshore wind as well. David, it that. is brilliant that we can end, um, having disagreed on shale gas, we can end on a note of agreement, because actually not only do I agree with you on, on solar panels on buildings, I'm actually putting them myself on some industrial buildings that I've got. So, David, thank you so much Excellent. for your thoughts. Excellent. I'm a great fan of solar panels on the roofs of buildings because then you get a win-win. But uh, it feels that David wants uh, us to basically be putting on the candles and turning off the lights if the wind doesn't blow. I think he's wrong. Let's hear what Simon says in Basingstoke. Good morning, Simon. Good morning, Richard. I've, I've never heard anyone talk such rubbish in my life. How can you run an industrial first world nation on wind power? It's ridiculous. We have nuclear technology. Rolls-Royce has developed small these developing small modular reactors. It's about time our politicians and our, some of our academics woke, woke up to reality and realised we are living in a real world where, to be honest, it's not just that supplies may, may be restricted, it's that we may not actually be able to obtain supplies from other countries. So this country needs to seek in energy independence. You're 100% right. Rather than a green dream. You're 100% right there, Simon. We have to be self-reliant on something as critical as keeping the lights on. But that's not the only thing, Richard. I mean, have we forgotten what happened during COVID and how reliant we are on nations like China for, for, the, for the basic uh, components of things like antibiotics? You're completely got... right. You're absolutely right uh, there, Simon. We, we can't be dependent on items of critical national infrastructure. Simon, uh, stay with us, stay with the show. Uh, keep the messages and the calls coming in. Thank you very much. There's Simon there from Basingstoke. He thinks that Dr David is has got it all wrong. Uh, there's another message here uh, who says, uh, from Gary, who says, do we not own the oil under the North Sea? North sea? Well, yes, the answer is that we do. Um, uh, lots of other people disagreeing with Dr David, but nevertheless, good to have that alternative point of view. Stay with us. Lots more in the second hour. It's Tice Talk on Talk Radio. Talk. Bold talk. talk Radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrible. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrible. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him, for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want. Richard Tice, powered by debate. Sunday morning with the Tice Man. Richard Tice, the heart of a common sense Sunday. Richard Tice, Paul Radio. Welcome back to Tice Talk. We are into the second hour, but my goodness me, in the first hour, we've had uh, lots to discuss about, about Ukraine and also about the cost of energy, about shale gas. And my word, uh, Dr. David Toke has really got people going uh, in terms of his views on uh, wind turbines and things. I'll read out some uh, of those texts and tweets later on, but I think it's fair to say uh, most people are agreeing with me, not with him. Uh, but one important tweet here uh, from Shumba, who says, the, the Ukraine is going through a terrible time, but I have to say how much I admire the people who are fighting to save their country. Families leaving, but the men staying, uh, leaving their families staying to fight. And that brings me into uh, my next guest, who is... Uh, an MP in Ukraine, Kira Rudik, uh, leader of the Voice Political Party, uh, who joins me now on Tice Talk. Uh, Kira, very good morning. Thank you so much for uh, speaking to us. And, you know, uh, this must be such a, a terrible time. You're in Kyiv, I believe, uh, as we speak. Um, what's what's the latest that's going on on the streets and, and sort of the mood amongst uh, you and your friends and, uh, you know, where you see things at? Hello, thank you for having me. So the mood is still very optimistic. Uh, we are training and you know why it's optimistic? Because the world was saying that we will fail after like one or two days and today is 11th day and we are still standing and kicking's, kicking Putin's um, behind. And uh, Ukrainian army is standing, the resistance is supporting the Ukrainian army, and we are making sure that we will not give up any major city to Putin's troops. So Kyiv, uh, where I am right now, is getting ready for a siege. We know that uh, there is a massive amount of uh, Putin soldiers specifically going to capture Kyiv. Uh, this is where the resistance team that I formed and uh, uh, our army are working together, and we are making sure that every single evening we're patrolling the city and checking that things are okay. So there has been intensive shelling uh, throughout the whole every of 11 days. And this is why we are uh, calling on all the NATO countries to help us and provide the no-fly zone over Ukraine. We know that we received uh, like a strong no, and we are asking again, because right now I, we are doing very good job on, on the land, fighting Putin's troops on the land, but we are not able to protect ourselves from the sky. So I, I armed myself, I'm carrying a gun right now, I'm training two hours a day to be able to uh, stand up shoulder to shoulder with our men, but there is nothing I can do to protect myself from the sky, from the rockets that are coming on us. And uh, this is the only thing that Ukraine do really, that Ukrainians do really need right now, is the protection from the sky. We can call it anyway, we can call it special operation of unknown forces. We can call it uh, somebody uh, left some planes and somebody flew them. So it's like a uh, really uh, doesn't matter how technically it is done, but we do need the protection from the skies because Putin is destroying our cities and Putin is destroying us from the air. He's basically shooting at us with uh, without um, for us an ability to uh, fight back in this matter. I mean, so... I'm I mean, I'm, I'm so in awe and admiration of what you personally are doing and, and all of your fellow citizens. I mean, it really is uh, quite extraordinary. And as you say, the success that you've had so far in, in holding them back, um, despite everything that's going on, you know, we're seeing pictures of, of sort of almost the complete annihilation of cities like uh, Mariupol. Um, and, and I guess, in a sense, 
Putin's getting more and more aggressive on shelling because he's he's losing the ground war. Right. A and that's because of your resistance. And uh, y you talk about that. We, we, we see pictures of, of columns of, uh, of vehicles and therefore soldiers outside Kyiv waiting to come in. But, uh, you know, they're obviously uh, I, I'm, I'm surmising, but I could be wrong, obviously. Um, they're obviously concerned how much resistance they're receiving. I, I think, as you've heard from Western political leaders, the problem with a no-fly zone is the risk that that actually draws us much closer to a, a European nuclear war. And, and that's the difficulty for us in the West. Let me tell you this. Uh, two days ago, Putin's forces uh, bombed the nuclear plant in Zaporizhia the largest nuclear plant in Europe. How close does that get us to the full-scale nuclear crisis? I think Putin is crazy and he is a, a war criminal and he would do anything that possible and impossible to get to his goal. And so he is uh, breaking all the international laws. The shelling is going on civilians and Probably you have heard that yesterday uh, there was an agreement that they will let out the peaceful convoy. And as we expected, they did not. They started shooting at it right away. So we have been at war with Putin for eight years since he took the Crimea and attacked the eastern part. And I can tell you right away, he uh, does not keep his word. He does not care about condemnation or like angry emails from the United Nations. He doesn't care about uh, about sanctions, and he wouldn't care about uh, giving his word and then taking him back. And so I'm super frustrated when I hear the word peace going um, out of his mouth, because this means war, this means he will be more cruel, he will break all possible laws, and that he will try to destroy us. And at the same time, at the exact same time, when he is attacking civilians, attacking peaceful uh, refugees, attacking nuclear plants, the NATO countries and, and uh, are saying, we are, there are rules that we want to obey. We are not really uh, ready to provide an off-life zone. I feel that there is an illusion that this like a major war has not begun yet. Well, it is. It is on, and and everybody is involved in it. Because do you? What is the good outcome that everybody sees of it? Uh, Putin would... wouldn't stop on Ukraine. He said that that he will next will be Poland and and Baltic countries, and these are NATO countries. The, 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 so yeah. I mean, there's no question, Kira, that the only good outcome is the removal of the Putin regime from from running Russia, and it's a question of of how that is achieved. I, I think that the from what we're seeing and hearing the sanctions are getting tighter and tougher and are beginning to impact uh, on Russian citizens and the oligarchs. I agree with you entirely. He clearly doesn't care about all the suggestions of war crimes and all that, and he's completely untrustworthy. And whether or not uh, the supposed ceasefire today in Mariupol works uh, or not. Um, are you getting enough access to uh, medical supplies and more uh, anti-tank and uh, anti-air missiles from, from what you're aware of, Kira? Uh, yeah, we are getting enough of medical supplies and honestly all the countries, uh, all the democratic countries of the world have been amazing uh, providing Ukraine with uh, all necessary support, support for our refugees, financial aid. But there is something that we cannot build ourselves and this is a uh, air force protection and even if we had all money in the world we would not be able to build yeah. it like in one week and we need it tomorrow because you see what is happening you have seen all the images of just peaceful cities being destroyed as for putin and what's going on in russia today at 2 p.m russian time there will be protests in all the major cities of russia where we would hope to see first of all uh, how many people are there who are able to stand up for themselves? And if the sanctions actually started working on this level of people getting really frustrated and really annoyed, because uh, if we are talking about uh, overthrowing Putin's regime, then it wouldn't probably happen with him saying, OK, I'm tired, I'm gone. It will be either his inner circle saying, OK, yeah, dude, this is not going to work for us. We 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 moved our children back from London and Miami back to uh, beautiful Indeed. cities of Oral. And uh, but but we also think that there, there should be like uh, going from the 
uh, bottom to the top. And today we will see if that is actually no, working. I, I, think, I think that's absolutely right, Kira. My sense is that this, the sanctions have got to get tighter and tighter on the Russian people and that, in a sense, they need to rise up. Um, Kira, thank you so much. Um, we so admire uh, your own bravery. Uh, you know, training yourself, uh, going out onto the streets, and that of all your colleagues. And we wish you uh, safety and uh, our very best thoughts. Uh, what you're doing to defend your country is truly, truly admirable. That was Kira Rudik, uh, MP in Ukraine, in Kyiv, leader of the Voice political party. Quite remarkable, uh, fantastic guest. And um, uh, we just had a, a message here uh, from someone who says... Uh, excellent guest. After what disaster will we finally call Putin's bluff re a nuclear war? These are difficult times. Uh, meanwhile, we're going to quickly take a call before the break. Carol is in London. Good morning, Carol. Good morning, Richard. How are you? Well, I'm OK, but, you know, it's it's not easy uh, listening to uh, Kira there in Ukraine. Not easy at all. Um, oh, yeah, I mean... Anyway, I'm calling about the chap you had on earlier who was banging on about having more wind farms. Oh, yes, indeed. Yeah. David Toke. And I just wanted to say that there's a terrible effect on um, wildlife from wind farms, particularly on migratory birds. It's something like uh, 1.5 million per year killed in Britain alone. Billions of insects. And, and and many bats as well, which um, it, it's quite cruel the way they die. They actually get lured by the sound of the blades and then their little lungs explode. So, I mean, this is just, I mean, nobody's even, you know, no, no one's, about this. You're right. Essentially, no one's talking about that at all, Carol. Um, help me because I don't know enough about that. Um, is, it, uh, is it more uh, with onshore wind turbines than offshore turbines? Well, currently we have quite a few offshore ones that are also affecting marine wildlife like whales and uh, probably dolphins, I'm not quite sure. But I think it's, it's already affecting them offshore. And I think, uh, you know, if we had more of them onshore, it would definitely have a more negative effect. I mean, the blades move at 180 miles per hour. So, I mean, that's quite, that's quite a lot. And you know, I mean, these are some, you know, threatened species. And, and, and Carol, playing devil's advocate, how do you respond to what they might say, which is, well, um, uh, in a sense, uh, it's more important to reduce emissions uh, than to save some birds and some bats? I know that's tough. Well, I know it's tough to ask the question, but I have to ask it. Yeah, well, firstly, I mean, the ecological disaster that's created by eliminating certain species of animals cannot even be predicted and would and the effects would be much sooner than you know this so-called uh issue of carbon you know being uh, you know what i mean like yeah no, this, it's a very interesting point you're, you're saying that if the the unknown consequences of removing yes. species uh, by accelerating their extinction, potentially, yes. if, if it's that bad. Um, Carol, right. thank you. For, that's that's really interesting. Um, th I've learned from your call. Thank you so much for that. Um, that was Carol in London. Her concerns that actually there's not enough discussion about the negatives of wind turbines from the likes of David Toke and the people who are pro-renewable energy. Uh, coming up, I'm going to be talking to my next guest after the break, Ross Feingold. Uh, who's in uh, Taiwan, about what's going on in China, the suppression of information there, and why actually China is not condemning Russia. Keep the calls coming in 0344 499 1000. Lots of tweets and messages uh, about my renewable discussion, uh, which I'll read out later. Stay with us. It's Ty's Talk on Talk Radio. Talk. Bold talk. talk Radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk Radio. A Feds archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him, for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
Talk Radio. Accept no substitutes. Access all arguments. The UK's official opinion exchange. Free speech radio. Shut up and listen. We're on your side. The home of common sense. Talk Radio! Welcome back to Ty's Talk. Well, that was an extraordinary discussion with Kira Riddick, the MP in Kiev, and lots of messages coming in from that. Uh, and, and really difficult, this. Uh, Jude says, uh, Ruddick is right, the war's already started. Uh, to not help Ukraine is an abomination. Well, we are helping Ukraine with, uh, with weapons, anti-tank weapons, uh, anti-air missile weapons. Uh, and there are pictures, actually, of a Russian helicopter being shot down using those weapons. Um, but actually... Uh, here, the alternative is set out by uh, Mark, who says, uh, we cannot get involved in an air war over Ukraine with Russia. Uh, the Russians didn't shell the nuclear plants. Their objective was to secure control over these assets. And this kind of talk is going to make things worse. Look, the reality is Ukraine is not a NATO country. N NATO is a defensive alliance. And I support uh, the political leaders' uh, decisions that actually... Uh, we can't enforce a no-fly zone over Ukraine uh, because that will uh, be seen as a provocative act. Whereas the moment that uh, Putin puts a toe cap into a NATO country, then that is very different. But these are not easy judgments. Uh, we are dealing with someone who does leave, does seem, uh, he, he's just not the man he was 20 years ago. And, you know, is he ill? Is he on steroids? What really is driving him? Hard to know. What we do know is that things are not... Uh, the, the information being given in China to uh, the people of China, citizens of China, is being restricted. And I'm joined by Ross Feingold, who's the Asia Political Risk Analyst based in Taipei. Ross, a very good morning to you. We've spoken before uh, about the risks of China. Tell us a bit about the suppression of information in China about the war in Ukraine. I mean, it's this is on newspapers all over the world. It's the big global story, except in China. Yeah, it's a, you, it's an accurate description. Uh, I I do speak Mandarin, and I've been on uh, multiple uh, talk shows, both on television or live stream programs or, or over the internet in recent days, and. Uh, it may come as a surprise to some people and maybe not as a surprise to other. A large number of Chinese people do go over their firewall to watch overseas media. So they do have exposure to what we're talking about or what we broadly consider to be the truth without getting into you know, this sidetracked into media biases uh, or left, right media, et cetera, uh, in Western countries. Uh, so Chinese people do have access. I mean, they could hear me present what I think is an accurate view that Russia has invaded Ukraine. But notwithstanding that, they genuinely believe what the state media tells them. And the state media is basically repeating the talking points from Russia insofar as that Ukraine was a, a great security threat to, to Russia, that Ukraine is dominated or its government is dominated by neo-Nazis, not just nationalists. Uh, the, these accusations about an extraordinary amount of repression of Russian speakers in the eastern part of the country. Uh, so what, what people in China see in their state media uh, or that they share among themselves in, in on Weibo or, or other micro-messaging platforms that are popular in China, it generally reflects Russian talking and, point. And, and, and uh, Ross, to, I mean, to what extent is there any coverage in the, in the main media, like pictures of the devastation in cities and things? Is is there any of that? Very very little. Uh, you know, it's almost like it's an afterthought because the main focus is more on what Ukraine has done wrong, what the Western countries have done wrong, which generally is along the lines of interference in, in, uh, in, in if not an internal affair then something between russia and ukraine and this is just the us and to a lesser extent nato trying to once again police the world so again it's, it's very much uh, a russia message uh not the, the human side is not uh really a, a big is, is, focus. There, is there any reporting of the casualties uh you know very the... very little i mean they'll, they'll spend much more time reporting on the efforts they make to evacuate their own nationals than they would on on uh, the casualties or the effect on civilians. 
And, and and what about the reporting in China on on the sanctions regime uh, that the West is imposing on Russia? Uh, is that talked about? And if so, in what terms? It, it gets flipped around that China is going to expand trade with Russia. It's going to support a, a fellow friendly country. Uh, yeah, I'm sure most of the listeners are aware of Putin's trip to Beijing for the Olympics and and the statements and announcements that they made. Uh, and they're just following through on that. And we're going to stand with our friend. It's a great opportunity for Chinese companies. It's a great opportunity to expand the use of the UN as, as a currency for international trade. So yeah, to answer your question, it gets flipped around. There are sanctions. And here are all the good things we're going to do as a result. Interesting, because I talked in my Sunday sermon this morning about what I call this new axis of communist evil that's descending uh, in the East uh, between Russia, uh, the Russian regime and the Chinese regime, as opposed to the people themselves, I think the vast majority of whom uh, don't want this war and this type of bullying behaviour. And essentially what you've just confirmed there is that actually China sees this um, not with horror like the rest of us, but the Chinese regime see this as a sort of trading opportunity to do more trade with Russia and, and to benefit from it. Yeah, I see, and not just on the business side, but of course on, on the political side as well. Uh, you know, did, did they really want Russia to do this? Well, probably not. I think they probably enjoyed watching the disunity that existed among the European countries in the United States uh, in December and January, uh, indecision of Germany, whether or not to suspend progress on Nord Stream 2, uh, President Macron trying to be the, the key negotiator, uh, the U.S. sometimes being left out of uh, multi-party talks. Uh, China probably enjoyed that, uh, but once Putin made the decision to invade Ukraine, uh, we're just not going to see this level of criticism that people want. And uh, if I could make one criticism of my country, uh, the United States and Secretary of State Blinken in, in recent days and weeks uh, has repeatedly telephoned the Chinese foreign minister asking for help. Uh, what does he think you know, Wang Yi is going to do? Say, sure, sure, Tony, I'm going to call up Putin and, and get done what you want. I mean, it's it, that's probably not a very good policy for the United States to pursue as opposed to uh, well, calling in, out in, China. In, in particular, Ross, given the concerns actually that China may use, the Chinese regime may use this as a, a sort of a, a pretext to advance their intentions to uh, to take over Taiwan. And it feels to me, I mean, it, my sense is these tough sanctions that we're imposing on Russia, I think we should be saying to the Chinese regime, if you go into Taiwan against its will, then the same sanctions would be imposed on you. It, it's certainly something to discuss. I, I, I don't get the feeling that at the moment uh, Western countries and their other partners like Australia or Japan want to have that conversation with China at the moment while they're dealing with sure. the crisis in, in Ukraine. Uh, but but there's another angle to that, which is the corporate world. And the corporate world obviously has a far greater presence in China than it does in Russia, notwithstanding a few notable examples in Russia in the energy sector. Uh, but the presence in China, of course, is much more broad, uh, if for no uh, other reason than Western companies manufacture in China uh, as well. Uh, of course, and and making huge sums of money and investing. Um, Ross, uh, we will come back to you and stay, uh, talk to you again, no doubt. Uh, thank you very much for your thoughts there about what's going on with uh, the lack of information about Ukraine uh, by the Chinese regime. That was Ross Feingold, who's the uh, political risk analyst. He's based in Taiwan. Fascinating comments. Stay with us. We're going to be coming back domestically. We're going to be talking about the uh, what's going on in Scotland with the Gender Recognition Reform Bill. Unbelievable when everything else is going on. Truly unbelievable. Stay with us. It's Ty's Talk. It's Talk Radio. Talk. Bold talk. talk Radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrible. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
Richard Tice on Talk Radio. Common Sense Radio for common sense people. Talk Radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. Richard Tice. Talk Radio. Welcome back to Ty's Talk. Lots of messages and tweets coming in. I'll get to some of those in a minute. Uh, we will be uh, taking uh, taking your calls as well, 0344 499 1000. Uh, we've got one here from Jan who says, we desperately need a referendum on net zero. We don't want our energy policy determined by a woman who wears 750 dresses and 500 handbags over arm, uh, while so many of the population freeze. There we are. Uh, where And Bob here says, Richard, why don't they halve the green levy as it's effectively doubled. Maybe Rishi is waiting for a good PR moment in May. Uh, well, there we are. And uh, lots of other messages coming in about uh, the issue in Ukraine. Uh, one here, a good question uh, from a text message. Why can't the UN send in a peacekeeping force? Well, the reality is you can only do that uh, when there's a desire from both sides uh, to seek peace. Uh, and of course, at the moment, we haven't got that from Russia. So it's a very different situation. Uh, anyway, uh, we need to go up to Scotland because whilst all of this, uh, these horrors are going on, uh, we have, um, we need to talk about the um, uh, the Gender Recognition Act. We're just waiting for my guest to come up. Uh, so I'm going to go up to York, actually, not Scotland first, where Mike is. Mike, very good morning to you. Uh, what's uh, what's on your mind this morning, Mike? Well, there's a couple of things. Um... Forgive me, but I, I've not got all my notes because I'm laid up. I've just had major surgery. Oh, I, I, hope, I hope you're recovering well. I am. Uh, I have answers to that. But what my main point is the wind farms. Uh, we're still waiting for a decision on the coal mine in Cumbria. Yes. This is where we want to sink uh, a, a coal mine so that we can use metallurgical coal to make wind turbines. Uh, uh, and uh, exactly. And where's that coal going to come from? Well, at the moment, it's coming from Australia, can you believe it? Madness. The CO2... Absolute madness. The, the, the CO2 produced in that, I mean, it's just ludicrous. Well, the thing more about it is one of the people, the opponents, chief opponents, is Ed Miliband. And Boris Johnson's not yet helping either. Uh, well, well um, I, I mean, this idea that wind turbines uh, is the solution that so many people seem to think... Look, um, it's part of a contribution towards uh, energy needs. But, I mean, I completely stumped uh, David Toke earlier when I said, what happens when the wind doesn't blow? And he had completely... Exactly. He had no answer whatsoever. I mean, it's just extraordinary. It's not only that. I mean, let's look at the environmental uh, impact on migrating birds. It's a well-known fact. It's proven now in North America and uh, the RSPB has also said that the wind farms are absolutely chewing up and destroying migrating birds. Um, routes. There's, there's no application whatsoever for where a wind farm should be sited so that birds can get through. Um, it's crazy. But again, this climate change, if you, I ask anybody to read the BBC News on the uh, uh, website, 12th of March 21, where it talks about the Cumbria coal controversy. But you've got to have metallurgical coal to smelt and make blades and it's as simple as that uh, that's right and also uh, to make high quality british steel and the idea that we are importing uh, coal uh, from far far across the world uh, in order to make british steel when actually uh, you know we could be using cumbrian coal and cumbrian jobs and investment is utterly uh, beyond me um mike thank you so much for your call i hope you recover quickly from your operation we are going to go further north from York up to Scotland because in Scotland uh, they are now looking to make it easier with the uh, with the SNP's gender recognition reform bill. Uh, they want to make it easier for people to change identities uh, in terms of uh, uh, without medical checks. They want it to be possible uh, to change your identity uh, at the age of sixteen not 18, and with just three months' notice as opposed to having actually uh, to wait for two years. Well, I'm dying to know, we're joined by Marin Smith, spokesman for Women Scotland, on this issue. Marin, a very good morning to you. So um, uh, this is all very nice for the SMP, uh, Nicola Sturgeon, 
uh, you know, trying to make things easier for uh, for people who want to transition from one sex to another. Um, what's the problem, Marin? Uh, good morning. The problem is that uh, the bill isn't really uh, intended to help people transition from one sex to another for the very simple reason that that is not possible. What the bill is proposing to do is opening... Um, the legibility criteria from less than 1% of the population to 100% of the population. You no longer have to show that you have a medical need to be legally recognised as the opposite sex. And for us, the problem is that uh, we have a lot of legal opinions. We also have a number of court judgments that show there is a difference between someone who has a gender recognition certificate and someone who does not have a gender recognition certificate who seeks access to spaces and uh, services provided for the opposite sex. Right. And so how do you get a gender recognition certificate currently? At the moment, what you would do is if you feel quite substantial amounts of distress, um, you would go and for... To begin with, you would go and see your um, GP, who would then diagnose you with gender dysphoria and who would talk over your options with you. Um, a medical transition is not right for everybody. It's also not possible for everybody. Um, and you would also be further referred to a psychologist. You would then provide... Um, evidence of this diagnosis and the second medical opinion to a panel which never sees you. They don't ask you any intrusive questions. Um, you collect, you also collect um, evidence of what the law calls living in um, your chosen gender. And what this amounts to is that you show that you have changed your name on gas bills, utility bills, phone bills. There is no one who checks whether you um, have changed your appearance. You just have to show that you have a medical need and that you would essentially function better if you were um, to be allowed to live in the role of the opposite sex. So, that, that, so that's literally just a virtual consultation as opposed to you know, a, 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 a proper face-to-face -face discussion? There's no discussion at all with the applicant. So what? what um, this is actually the most successful law we have on our books. 95% of applicants are successful. You can reapply as often as you like um, after a waiting period of six months. And unusually, you actually have access to a civil servant free of charge who will help you get all the necessary documentation together. The gender recognition panel, which is made up um, out of uh, a, a number of people who sit generally on tribunals who decide a lot of things in uh, across the UK in, in terms of legal matters, um, they would only look at your paperwork. They so, don't talk to you. They don't ask you any questions. Uh, that all sounds common sense. So, so why the pressure for this new bill and to make it so much easier with all the implications? And, and Well, that, that's a really good question. This is exactly um, the point we're making. The Scottish Government hasn't made the case for reform. What we have right now is currently cited as international best practice in other countries. There are, in fact, very few countries in the world who allow people to change their legal sex at all. And there are even fewer countries who allow people their legal sex without having to medically transition. And um, before, uh, before COVID hit, I actually spent a lot of time in the National Archives in Scotland looking through the original meeting minutes, letters between ministers. Um, when they wrote the Gender Recognition Act in 2004, this was in response to a court case at the European Court of Human Rights um, where a post-operative transsexual wanted to get married and couldn't because the UK did not have same-sex marriage and also it didn't recognise that this person um, had was living as a woman and, and 
wanted to marry a man and couldn't. And so when the bill was discussed originally, the intention was um, to insist on a medical transition. But, but, I mean, clearly it's your concern, I think, is the concern of so many, Marin, which is that it's, it's too easy and you haven't got the proper safeguards there. Uh, yes, it, Just yes, to finish, is, is that right? And well, Yeah, um, and, and, and back then, the bill was intended to be for a very, very small number of very vulnerable people um, who needed protection that didn't exist in law. Well, um, it's... And, uh, and, and they got this protection. The bill works incredibly well, and the numbers that were in 2004 estimated to be applying for a gender recognition certificate was 5,000, and we've just hit that 5,000 mark. So In, in 18 years. Um, Marin, we're going to have to leave it there, but um, uh, thank you very much indeed for your thoughts. Uh, it does seem to me that if it's working well at the moment then why change it? No one's given me a good answer to that question. Stay with us. We're going to be taking your calls, your views, your thoughts, your messages. Give us a call 0344 499 1000. It's Tice Talk on Talk Radio. Talk. Bold talk. talk Radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrible. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
Talk Radio. More taste, more flavour. Reach for the story. More outspoken. Error 5092. Argument failed to start. Talk Radio. There's still a good argument for listening. Welcome back to Ty's Talk here on Talk Radio. The skies are getting a little bit greyer here in London. I hope it's a bit brighter with you. We've got lots of messages coming in. Uh, one just here, uh, a text message come in from Sheila. In awe of Kira, so incredibly brave. One can only hope that wokeness and anti-patriotism hasn't infiltrated too far into our nation's psyche or we would be a walkover. Well, certainly from that previous discussion about what's going on with uh, making it easier and younger for, uh, for, for essentially for to be able to change one's uh, sexual identity uh, is a seriously uh, concerning uh, point of view. In my view, uh, I think, you know, that is a sign that we're becoming too woke. We're focusing on completely the wrong things. And I say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But maybe John in Fairham, good morning to you. You might have uh, a different view on that or something else. Uh, hi, Richard. Yeah, thanks for uh, getting back to me. Um, <clears throat> well, on, I wasn't really phoning about that subject. No, but I have tell, my own you, view. tell us, tell us what you wanted to talk about. Uh, I'm talking about wanted to talk about the uh, the fracking uh, idea, you know. Yes, shale gas and, and some some of the myths about it. Well, a lot of people are concerned about earthquakes or earth tremors uh, being caused by fracking, but a lot of people don't realise that we have on average 300 earth minor earthquakes or earth tremors a year in the UK. And these are sort of below two on the Richter scale, which is about the equivalent to a heavy lorry passing by. And that's, um, that's, that's really important, actually, John, in order to, to understand... It sounds a bit scary when you use the word earthquake, but that level yeah. of two, as you say, is the equivalent of a lorry driving past your house. Yes, absolutely. And it just doesn't make sense to drag coal halfway around the world with the amount of... Um, CO2 that must be produced by the ships bringing it here when, when we've got our own beneath our feet. Uh, like you say, the treasure beneath our feet should be utilised, um, at least in the short term, until technology has perfected ways of creating energy by other methods. Well, that's, and that's the point, isn't it, John? We de Look, I, I love investing in new technology. I think, you know, we, we all benefit from it. Oh, but, absolutely. But we don't know how quickly those technologies with brilliant engineers and designers, how quickly they will come forward and then be able to build them uh, so that actually they can reduce emissions. And even the EU, bless their cotton socks, they've now recognised that gas is actually essentially a transition uh, yes. fuel uh, towards yes, and, and a greener world. Fairly and, clean, a fairly clean fuel too. And of course it's a very clean fuel. And there is another huge opportunity here where again we could lead the world where actually you could have, you could extract our shale gas that we all own and have a stake in, you could use it for yeah. gas-fired power plants, and then actually you can use the reverse new technologies, essentially for carbon capture of the CO2 produced, and put it back uh, miles underground, kilometres underground, back into the shale. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And, and not only that, but at the present time, we are having to buy fuel for essential heating and manufacturing and lighting um, from com countries that are essentially our enemies. And, and it's important. I'm really glad, John, that you use this issue of the, uh, the sort of the seismic activity, the size of a supposed earthquake, because the uh, quadrilla who were doing the fracking uh, in the Boland Shale near Blackpool, uh, they had to um, give notice to uh, essentially to the authorities whenever there was a uh, a figure um, supposed earthquake of 0 0.5, and um, the 0 0.5 is the equivalent of standing up from your chair and moving the chair backwards on the floor. Yeah, that is about yeah, the equivalent I don't believe it. because it's yeah. a log logarithmic scale. 1.5 is the equivalent of dropping a watermelon from your shoulders onto the floor in your kitchen. Yeah. It's, it, yeah. And, and when people understand what that means, then actually the sort of so-called so very scary word earthquake actually is put into context, and it's really important yeah. that everybody yeah. understands that. But again, John, um, I'm with you. Thank you very much 
for your thoughts. This is a big, important debate. Um, and we're going to go to North Yorkshire, where Emma is patiently waiting. Good morning, Emma. Morning, Richard. Loving everything you're doing and standing for. It's brilliant. Thank you. What's, uh, what's on your mind this morning? Oh, just Well, just the energy resources thing again. Um, I come from a belief um, that we really need to look after our planet. Yes to cleaning up rivers, seas, yes to more trees, use of less plastic. But global warming is just not a thing. As David Bellamy said, it's a nonsense and the world just goes in cycles, despite what the man does. Um, there were times that we had grapevines in the north of England. It was that hot uh, in Roman times. Um, it said, in the papers, it says that ozone layer has apparently repaired. Uh, the BBC stated that, and it's the smallest it's ever been on record. And NASA says the world is going into a period of cooling, and the coldest temperatures ever recorded on planet Earth were in the last 10 years, um, especially in North America. I mean, the, so the, the globe the, just moves in cycles. Th th this is the point, isn't it, Emma? Because actually, um, the truth is that climate change has existed since time began for millions of years, and it yeah, will continue for millions more, more years. It. And, and of yeah. course, it moves in cycles. 40 years ago, 50 years ago, people were worried about an ice age. And the reality yeah. is, you get warming periods, and I think there's no doubt we are in a warming period. Um, but there are so many factors about which actually we have no control at all, whether it's volcanic activity, whether it's solar variability, whether it's sea level oscillation, th that impact on climate change um, that we can't impact at all. Yes. We all want cleaner air. As you say, quite rightly, we, we all care about our environment, um, but let's do things in a sensible, affordable, strategic way uh, rather than actually burden the UK and burden our young and our old with higher costs and sending all yeah. our jobs and money overseas. It seems madness to me. Can I just... My, my brother's an environmental engineer and he's always going on about, you know, why aren't we using tidal power as this, an island surrounded by water? Even if we use the seven bore alone, that uh, would create a huge amount of energy. Yes, yeah. it's expensive, but the amount of money we've thrown at COVID Com nonsense the last two years. I completely <laughs> agree, Emma. And, and again, once again, there was a government-backed scheme down in Swansea, the Swansea Bay Lagoon, that I thought was excellent, um, that would have created, been our first, first big foray into tidal power. You can predict tides for about 100 years, I'm told. Um, and, and we should be doing that, and we should do the first one like that, uh, and then we should learn from it, tweak it, adjust it, improve it, and again, be a world leader in this stuff. Uh, but yeah, again, the government, the government, they bottled it, they tried to outsource all of the risk, uh, and, uh, and, and eventually they then uh, reneged on what, uh, what they were doing, and I think they, they actually withdrew the permission, and it, and it just seems madness. It's another really reliable source of energy, and other countries do it, and we should do the same. The water wouldn't go anywhere. I mean, with with the wind turbines, I actually went down to London when we had the the so-called crazy storm, and I hardly saw a branch blow actually the whole way down York to London. But they, st I didn't see any wind wind um, turbines going. I've got know, videos of them start stationary. Oh, I know. And, when and it's supposed to be really windy. Yeah, when it's too windy, what happens is actually the government <laughs> yeah, has to pay subsidies to the wind turbines. Yeah. Emma, thank you so much for your call. You're with me. We need this debate. We need a referendum on net zero uh, give us your support uh, keep the calls coming in 0344 499 uh, let's try that again 0344 499 1000 you're listening to ty's talk it's talk radio talk. Bold talk. talk radio listen on your smart speaker watch it live on your smart tv the world headquarters of common sense talk radio Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him, for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him, for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want. Mid-morning talk. Sunday talk. Talk radio. Take a chance with the Tice Man. Talk radio. Richard Tice. Sunday morning devotion. There isn't a sermon. Talk radio's common sense weekend. Richard Tice on Talk Radio. Welcome back to Tice Talk and good afternoon. Yes, we are into the afternoon. We're into the third hour. Things have been flying by on the show. Lots of discussion, obviously, about Ukraine but also about the vital issue of net zero, of shale gas. Uh, one message just come in here. Yes, please, Richard, on a referendum on net zero. Lots of others I'll get to later. And, of course, one of the reasons is the huge increase in costs. And in my view, we're only at the foothills of the net zero cost mountain. It's like being at base camp of Everest as to where costs may go. And we've got an inflation crisis driven by... Uh, supply chains being constricted and I wanted to talk about one of the uh, one of the items uh, of that uh, supply chain crisis and one of the things that's driving up prices who'd have thought for example that um, uh, just a year or so ago the cost of uh, shipping a a pair of trainers a pair of shoes from China to the UK would have been about 60p a pair it's now at well over uh, two pounds possibly over two pounds fifty a pair now just that's the shipping cost and that's why it's really good to talk to uh, my next guest Alan Murphy who's the chief executive and partner at Sea Intelligence to understand what's going on in the shipping industry we see these huge container ships massive piles of containers and we take it all for granted but something's going on and I think it's important that we discuss it and understand it because over the last year or so, all of a sudden, costs have gone through the roof and these companies are making off like bandits. They are making a true mega fortune. Uh, Alan, a very good afternoon to you. Thanks for being you. with us. Um, so help us a little bit on uh, what's going on in the container shipping industry, why costs are soaring, which obviously is contributing towards inflation. Sure. Well, well. first of all, it's important to note that we have gotten more notoriety than we've had ever in the 60 years of container shipping. It's like it's like the plumbing in your house. You really only notice it when it doesn't work. Yes. Um, so uh, to put a very complex interplay of very challenging situations together um, and put it in a, in a very short note, what's happened is as a, as a consequence of the pandemic, um, mostly in the U.S., and the reason why I speak about the U.S. is that's where we've seen all the growth from a global perspective. It's basically the used consumer used to spend 65% of the disposable income on services, and they've shifted that down to 60%. But even that small decrease in service spending meant a, a massive increase in durable goods spending, so washing machines and other uh, household appliances. Um, and that basically led to a 10% increase, long-term increase in, in container demand into the U.S., which knocked down um, the infrastructure, the hinterland infrastructure, the ports couldn't keep up with it, rail yards, uh, trucking de depots, uh, distribution centers, and so forth. Um, and that turned it into a supply crisis because the vessel started getting backed up um, and we're, we've now consistently for more than a year going into the U.S., especially Long Beach and Los Angeles, which is the main gateways into the U.S., vessels are waiting two, three weeks to get in, which means that vessels are tied up, supply is tied up, and that supply has been drained from the rest of the world market, which is so, why so everybody the, else is feeling it. So that, that waiting in, in two or three weeks for a ship, of course, that's then leading to a restriction in supply of the containers themselves. Exactly. And that's adding to the crisis. I mean, this is so serious in the U.S. that actually... Uh, President Biden actually referred to it last week in his State of the Union speech. And he's talking about the possibly being a cartel and how they break it. Yeah. Well, I think it's it's, it's important to separate the two. Um, the shipping lines didn't create the crisis. Did it take advantage? Oh, certainly they did. Um, it, it is a pandemic crisis, or rather, it's not a pandemic crisis, it's a consequence of the pandemic. Um, if, if the 
the use consumer could go back to the normal uh, uh, in, on sensible spend on restaurant bars and, and nightclub and stuff and, 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 you know, import less stuff, we wouldn't have this problem. Um, is there an easy regulatory solution? No. Um, it's a supply crisis, and even if we could magically fathom up, I know, 100 ships, those 100 ships would just get stuck waiting outside of Los Angeles. Um, there's really no simple solution to this, and the shipping lines, they're throwing as much supply as they can. Every single boat that can float is on the sea right now. There's no shortage of, of deployed uh, capacity. Interesting. So actually, you're suggesting that it's more capacity in the ports as opposed to a capacity... Uh, of the ships and the containers themselves. I mean, I was reading figures uh, here, Alan, that the um, the container container shipping industry uh, have made profits in in 2021 alone equivalent to five times the profits that it made in the entire decade from 2010 to 2020. I mean, whether or not those closer, stats are right, I mean, these are no closer closer to ten times actually. Wow. <laughs> Now that should be put some perspective. The shipping lines have been had had a disastrous ten years of of basically, as I often have said, they they lose about one hundred and twenty dollars every time they move a container, which suggests that they shouldn't be moving containers. That's how it was for ten years. Uh, it's hard to feel sorry for the shipping lines through all their historical troubles because all of these wounds were self-inflicted. They bought too many vessels, brought in too many too much capacity. Now, the, the the situation has shifted violently over the last year and a half, especially, um, and and freight rates are now uh, somewhere between five and ten times of where they have been historically. But it should also be said those historical rates were loss making for the shipping lines. And and so, Alan, does this ease? I mean, if if you're right that the constraint is actually at the ports, not on the ships themselves. I mean, how does this ease? Well, that's the problem. It doesn't. Um, there, there's a there, there's a few quick solutions. If if the U.S. economy completely tanked tomorrow, um, then it might ease in a couple of months. But that seems a bit like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Um, there's there's no solution. It takes three years to build a container vessel. So supply, uh, it's only starting to come in late 23, early 24. Um, but 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 the real problem is it's the lack of investments in the ports, the terminals, the hinterlands, and and also the horrible inefficiency of the American ports. Um, they are much less efficient than the than not say Asian ports, which are the most efficient, but far below European standards. Um, and and there's a lot of politics behind that. It's both labor. It's uh, the ports aren't open 24/7 as they are in most other worlds, and there's no automation in the in the U.S. ports. Um, fascinating. Uh, Alan, thank you so much. It's, it seems to me that uh, if those prices are driving world prices, then that's going to be uh, the same for us here in the UK, even though I think actually we have got plenty uh, of, uh, of port capacity, of uh, container capacity. Uh, but there we are. That's one of the reasons why we've got an inflation crisis, because the cost of shipping goods has gone literally through the roof and... Uh, the shipping industry is making massive fortunes, massive profits, allegations of a cartel, uh, and even President Biden, when he's awake, talking about it. Uh, anyway, we're going to go to, uh, I think, Slough, where we've got Rita. Rita, good afternoon to you. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I um, just want to say congratulations for, for being Reform Party leader exactly a year ago today, which happens to be my birthday. Today oh, there well. you are. Well done, Reed. Happy birthday. <laughs> well remembered. I think I'd even forgotten myself. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was a really nice birthday present for me, I think, when, when you became it. <laughs> <laughs> nice birthday wish. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to say um, about the energy crisis. I exactly agree 100% with you what you're saying we should be tr tr trying using as much as our um, sh shale grass as, as possible it's, it's, it's um, you know nonsense having to buy um, you know from from abroad you know, the prices are, are much more ex you know ex expensive and the, so obviously the prices have gone up I, I you know I always I believe in self self-sufficiency a lot the, the, like this is do. this is the key yeah. isn't it that on yeah. things that are critical to our existence critical to our national infrastructure uh, we've got to be self uh, sufficient uh, self reliant self you know independent uh, we shouldn't be having to essentially rely on the goodwill of others because otherwise we're completely exposed and vulnerable yeah that's right yeah yeah and I also want to say, I hope this war in Ukraine 
ends as soon as soon as possible. I hope he ends right now. To be honest, well, of, of course, just we, mad. We all, we all do. It's uh, it's absolutely desperate. And uh, yeah. you may have heard some of my callers earlier. Uh, that brave Ukrainian MP, uh, just uh, just extraordinary. Mm, yeah, that's all um, I wanted. To well, brilliant, Rita. Thank you so much indeed. So uh, there's Rita in Slough. She supports me on the plans for a referendum on net zero. I think we're going uh, west to Hereford, where we've got Heather. Good afternoon, Heather. Yes, hello, hello. Um, yes, we've got to apply a lot, a lot of common sense to our energy thinking. And I'd, I'd like to know where we've got to with water power. You know, um, could, could we... Just like have some turbines. Uh, absolutely, can... yes. Well, um, you're quite right. The whole issue of, of uh, hydropower, tidal power, uh, is uh, you know it's a real yes. opportunity we've got. You know we're an island, um, yes. and uh, I don't know if you're aware, Heather, but there was a plan to have uh, the first big uh, tidal power scheme down at Swansea, Swansea Bay. It was a give or take a I billion. Heard about it. Yes. Yeah, it was a billion pound scheme. Uh, there were lots of private investors were lined up. Um, I think it was actually, and it was going to create huge jobs and a real sort of actually almost a sort of a tourism uh, opportunity as well. Yeah. Well, where is all that technology? Who's talking about it? Um, Who's in charge of it? So, um, so we're it, surrounded by water. Well, exactly. The technology's got, there. I mean, uh, uh, rivers with so much power going to waste. Uh, exactly. The the, um, the technology was there. It was all set up. And then, essentially, uh, the government withdrew its consent from the scheme and uh, the whole thing uh, oh, essentially fell away. Right. We need that uh, thinking. We need people in, uh, we do. You know, on the case now to get us uh, forward we, we, and we, gradually you know, go away from some of the stuff we, we're reliant on. At you're quite moment. right, Heather. We need these new technologies, these different range of sources of energies, and to learn from yes. them and get better and better. Heather... Um, thank you so much for your thoughts. Uh, Heather's with me. Let's have more different types of energy. Let's invest in new technology. But for heaven's sake, uh, let's use the treasure under our feet rather than ignoring it. Uh, give us a call, 0344 499 1000. Lots of messages and tweets coming in. One here, yes, please, Richard, on a referendum on net zero. There we are. Uh, well, there's another vote. Uh, give us a call. Stay with us. It's Tice Talk on Talk Radio. Bold talk. talk Radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
Talk Radio. 21st Century Debate. Speak once, think twice. Talk Radio. Exhalation, conversation, confrontation. Fine talk in common sense. Talk Radio. Welcome back to Ty's Talk. We're well into the third hour. Good afternoon to you if you're just uh, signing in, listening in. We've got a message in here. Uh, which is uh, to do with the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, who says more than one and a half million refugees now have crossed into neighbouring countries in 10 days. This is the fastest growing refugee crisis in Europe since the Second World War. Uh, About 129,000 into Poland on one day on Saturday alone. Uh, Extraordinary numbers uh, likely to increase, uh, give or take by, it seems, a million a week. Truly, truly horrific. Susan, she t- uh, tweets in, it's quite obvious Putin is cold and ruthless due to the fact he's bombing residential areas where civilians live. He's also cut off the water supply to people. Disgraceful, cruel behaviour. Uh, it is that and so much more beyond. We've got a call here, Neil in Banbury. Good afternoon, Neil. What's uh, what's on your mind? How are you doing? Hi, Richie. Good afternoon. And um yeah, I've been listening to this, and I work in the field of international communications and PR. Um, and I'd like a request for you and the talk radio team to lead the way with the media and stop referring to Putin as President Putin. Um, he's not elected. He's a dictator and should be referred to, I believe, as... So when you start a news bulletin, it should say Russian dictator Vladimir Putin, not... President Putin. Actually, um, do you know what? I, I, that gives him credibility. It's it's um, a, it's a um, really good point. I mean, technically, he is the president, but you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, his elections are a farce, and he is he is the bully Putin, the dictator Putin, isn't it? Well, he's got the same psychometric profile as Stalin and Hitler, and other despots have gone in history. Um, each time the media referred to him as president gives him some sort of credibility and statesman-like figurehead. He's not. Let's all face it. So I think the media and the news editors could at least consider this uh, because each time you say it, it's given him credibility. And, and Neil, do you think that he's changed in the last 15 to 20 years? I mean, 15 to 20 years ago, political leaders in the West thought he was a strong, robust man, but but a man they could do business with in some way. What are your thoughts on that? Um, look, what he is is a, a KGB colonel that never got over the fact that the Russian USSR collapsed. Um, he's a narcissist, um, and people like that don't can't come to terms with an evolving future. Um, he wants to take us back to 1945 and the USSR. It's quite simple. Uh, it's it, it's horrific, and uh, the consequences for millions of people. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. Uh, and and uh, in a sense, I can't see. Uh, well, the only way I can see this ending is when his regime is ended, uh, and and but that has to be ended internally in Russia. Um, I agree with that. And if you look at what happened with the the Nazis, they didn't really surrender until Hitler was gone. And I think we have the same situation. He's surrounded by sycophants. In a way, he talks about Nazis. The only Nazis I see are. He is the new Nazi. Um, and I think, uh, you know, China have a key role to play in this. They've got to decide whether they want, um, you know, a world that's... Uh, do they want to be in bed with the new Nazi or do they want a world that they can actually trade with or a world that's actually nuclear dust? Well, that's right. And I've been talking about China and, you know, I've got real concerns that they're basically aligning themselves uh, with Russia, creating this sort of... Uh, a, a new axis of <clears throat> communism uh, and it may be that they sort of feel that if they can uh, dictate things uh, with certain countries that China's got in their Belt and Road Initiative um, and create this whole new axis uh, trading together, supporting each other then they become uh, less reliant on on, uh, on the West and Putin can sell his, his oil and gas to China. Yes, and I think this is a, a pivotal moment for the world because, um, you know, we're, it's almost a history repeat. So in the 30s, you had Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, and their sidekick Italy. Now you've got China, Russia, and Iran. It's almost a repeat of history. And I think now the world's got to wake up. 
each time you click on your Amazon basket, uh, you're buying some more rubbish from China. You know, so the West, we've all got to wake up for this. I think that's right. Absolutely, Neil. And uh, I think that uh, China needs to know that if they uh, were to go into, uh, if they were going to Taiwan, then actually similar sort of sanctions would be imposed from the West as we're imposing on Russia. Because if you don't stand up to it, then the bullies are just going to keep bullying us. Uh, and and uh, this is, it is the school ground bully, isn't it? I mean, uh, and I think China's different because uh, executive boards across the world went to China in the 90s because they could get stuff made cheap, make more profit. Um, so, you know, everyone's got a, a stake in this and they've got to pull back manufacturing to their own countries. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, become, wake up. Wake up and become much more self-reliant and independent. Neil, thank you so much for your thoughts there. That was Neil in Banbury. We've got lots of messages coming in here. Uh, we've got one from Chris that says, the next zero agenda's left us dependent on Russia for gas and China for lithium. Why did our politicians spend so long prostrating themselves to Greta instead of protecting our energy security? How could they be so stupid? Chris, that is so right. You are completely on it. How on earth could they have been so stupid? That's why actually I say that the government's plans for net zero are net stupid. Uh, give us a call 0344 499 1000 with your thoughts. Am I right? Am I wrong? Or am I somewhere in the middle? I'm not sure. Anyway, we're heading back up north to Rotherham, where I hope that uh, Kerry is waiting patiently on the line. Hi, Kerry. Good afternoon, Richard. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Uh, how about yourself? What would you like to share with all of us? Well, I have a 21-year-old um, bisexual, non-binary adult child. Um, and I wanted to share that He's, 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 with he's you. A, a grandson of yours. It's my... Well, son, it's my son, although he claimed he's not my son, he's not my son. Yes. And I wanted to share that journey with you to let you know how we got to where we are yeah, now. Th that's interesting, Kerry. And so, um, in a sense, uh, yeah, give us some give us some thoughts on, on that journey. Well, at, at 16, he told me he was bisexual, which I was fine with. Um, and then he had two... Um, what they described as boyfriends, but had female genitalia um, and identified as boys, even though they had female genitalia and were the same age as him at that time, which was 18. And so, although um, he called them his boyfriends, they were still... Um, they have not started the transition process yet. They were still too young. Yes. Um, and then um, he had a um, relationship um, during lockdown. And, um, again, he said it was his boyfriend, but still had female genitalia. And because it was lockdown, um, his boyfriend um, moved in with us. Right. And just before my son went away to university, um, he told me he was non-binary, and I can't say he anymore, it's them and they, um, that I've not got a son anymore because he doesn't have a gender. And he's changed his name to the one I gave him at birth and, changed, and he calls that his dead name now. So he's, um, he's changed his name from that to a new name? Yeah, and it, the name I gave him is his dead name, as he calls it. Um, um, uh, and and even, so the, well, the new name is what, Kerry? Uh, I'd rather not say Kerry. Okay, like sure, yeah, sure, yeah. Side. Yeah, quite. Um, but I really struggle with it because his sexual identity I have no problem with. He's bisexual, that's fine. But I struggle with the non binary. I support him. Of course. Because he is, is my son, yeah. and I've got to support him. Of course, absolutely, Kerry. We're all with you on that. Um, what I've said to him is, um, I, I don't know whether this is, is a phase you're going through because you're confused, basically, because you've been with two people that you call male, that female genitalia. Yes, you know, that's indeed. That's enough to blow anybody's mind. So I said, look, while you're at uni, 
Yes. Um, let's, well, let's call well, it a phase. Well, look, Kerry, um, uh, our thoughts and support, and you're quite right, of course, uh, you must provide that support and want to provide that support. And, and thank you so much for sharing that with us, actually, uh, and all the emotion uh, that that has for you. Um, uh, and, you know, we understand that. So, Kerry, thank you so much. That was Kerry in Rotherham uh, with um, uh, her questions and just sharing that, uh, having a non-binary person, um, uh, her son, uh, interesting thoughts there. Give us a call, 0344 499 1000. Uh, lots coming up in the last half hour. In particular, we're going to be talking about um, the tunnel under London that we've all forgotten about. Cost 20 billion quid, never opened. What was it called? Oh, yes, Crossrail. Stay with us. It's Ty's Talk here on Talk Radio. Talk. Bold talk. talk Radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want. On Talk Radio. A first magnitude star of common sense. The Tice Man. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. Richard Tice. Talk Radio. Hi, welcome back here. We're into the last half hour of my show uh, this afternoon. Messages coming in, calls coming in. One here from Paul who says... Uh, shale gas has the major problem of polluting the groundwater with deadly chemicals. We then drink them in our taps. Paul, that is simply not true. You've been uh, believing uh, the nonsense, the misinformation. First of all, the chemical use is very, very mild. Secondly, um, it's sent down about two kilometres uh, underground, whereas, of course, groundwater is, uh, is much closer to the ground. Uh, that's just simply not the case. And the other point, Paul, is there are other technologies apart from fracking in order to extract shale gas that don't use chemicals. So surely, let's be a world leader in trying the new technologies, the different technologies, and let's make them work better and better so that we can ext extract that shale gas. Why would you just, because if you don't believe in one technology, why wouldn't you say, let's try the other ones, let's see how they work, let's improve it, let's make it work because the value of the treasure is so great 
that we really should do everything possible to see if we can sensibly extract it. Surely that's where we can agree with that, Paul. Anyway, uh, we're going to go to South Nottingham where Andy is waiting patiently. Hi, Andy. Good afternoon, Richard. How are you? OK? I'm all right, thanks. I'm all right, despite everything that's going on. What's on your mind, Andy? Well, it's, it's a general thing, really, Richard, regarding uh, fracking and zip net zero carbon emissions and um, the referendum you, you're talking about and a national debate. Yes. Uh, and also the influence of the mainstream media, which tends to be closing the door to the likes of you, yourselves. It's uh, outrageous. I, I'm just wondering how we can get over all these... Well, uh, the, the great thing is by launching a cross-party campaign involving people from all parties or no parties, we're going to force it onto the national agenda because you know, it's so important to our lives, uh, Andy. It, it, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, it changes the type of cars we drive, the the, uh, the way they want us to heat our homes. Uh, you know, they, they say that we've got to change what we eat, when we eat, and restrict the amount of travel. And, and I'm saying, look, this is... This is life-changing uh, uh, yeah, proposals yeah. for us. And uh, if, rather than just being sort of smeared as a denier, we need to have a proper grown-up, open, sensible, respectful national debate about it. And if it's that life-changing, frankly, we should have a referendum on the government's proposals as opposed yeah. to some other proposals that could actually be smarter. I love I technology, agree. but quite a great hundred percent, Richard. You know, I mean, the the, uh, the 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 what was it? A tweet I think that came in from Paul just there. You know, he believes that chemicals in fracking uh, could be a problem. Well, Paul, firstly, look at the information that shows that it's not. Look at what's going on in America. But even if that doesn't convince you, why wouldn't we say? I tell you what, Paul, let's agree to use one of the other technologies. Try that, yeah. improve it, tweak it, and be a world leader in it. That must be yeah. right. It's, I find it absolutely crazy and, uh, look, under the Conservative Boris Johnson, his ideas of net zero and uh, the COP26 seminar, whatever it was, whatever you want to call it. There's another word for it, but we're not saying it on air. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's balmy. Balmy, what's, what's going off, you know. It, I mean, I've, I've been alive through various governments now, you know, I'm 68, I'm not... I'm sort of, you know, I'm, but I've seen a lot and heard a lot. And uh, what we've got, Richard, is Conservative and Labour. And it's we're now being dragged down to, I don't know, I don't know what to say really. It's, but but the, the cost of, of energy, and they're doing nothing about it, you know, they've got to do something about it, surely, you know. Well, the, the, the simple thing is, at the moment, everything yeah. they're doing is driving the cost of energy northwards not southwards yeah, yeah. and unless yeah. there's a fundamental change and yeah. you know when we've got a business secretary quasi kwarteng who writes in the mail on sunday today that yeah. uh, that gas is expensive well no it's not it's dirt cheap if it's in the ground I if it's our gas it. i mean yeah. i don't know what planet the guy's living on but he's not living on the planet of common sense he really isn't and he needs to get a grip uh, i mean he is a clear and present danger to the UK economy, to our businesses, and to UK pe uh, citizens, and to yeah. our ability to keep warm. Um, Andy, thank you so much for your thoughts. Uh, that was Andy in Nottingham agreeing with me. We need to have a proper debate on energy. Um, now, I'm delighted we're uh, joined by the author of uh, a book called The Story of Crossrail, uh, which I think may have been volume one. Uh, depending on how long it takes to open the thing, it may be volume two and volume three, I don't know. Um, Christian Walmart, a very good afternoon to you. Uh, nice to see you uh, again. I think I'm seeing you. Uh, hi there, Christian. Can you hear me all right? Actually, I think you're just on the phone. I think I'm on audio. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. Christian, um, we spoke back in early October about uh, the uh, the progress of opening the, uh, the great new... Um, underground uh, line called Crossrail, which is now called the uh, Elizabeth Line after Queen Elizabeth. Fantastic. It's now March, Christian, and there's still no opening date. And we spent 20 billion quid of taxpayers' cash on this thing. What's going on? Uh, well, I, the good news is I'm pretty sure that it will open uh, straight after Easter. Uh, they're, they're running trains through it. They've done evacuation procedures and all sorts of other stuff. Uh, I've been down there. 
Um, it's absolutely fantastic, uh, but it's kind of the last minute. And I promise you this, Richard, that once you've gone on it, and once you've uh, uh, used it and, and uh, told Londoners about it, uh, you'll be blown out about it, and it, you'll you'll want to use it all the time. But it just, you know, it's a bit like waiting for the for the wedding party. Yeah, my, my problem is, Christian, I'm 57, and when you say Easter, I'm thinking, which Easter? Will I still be around by the time it's here? I mean, it's three and a half years late already. I think... Uh, with, with Richard, I'm 72, so look, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you, you lose that competition. Look, yeah, OK, it's three years late. Uh, it's 19 to 20 billion pounds instead of 15 billion pounds. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a railway that is absolutely transformative. Already house prices all along the route are going to okay. go through the roof. Uh, people are going to use it instead of the underground. It's not really an underground line. You said it was a, a new underground line. It's, it's much more than that. It, it's like big, proper uh, nine coach trains carrying 1,200 people going through. The, the, the platforms are all 250 metres long. It's, it's a completely different kettle of fish from being an underground line. I, I, I'm loving your optimism and your excitement, and you're obviously very lucky to have been down there, which is great. And, and when you say it's going to open, uh, will that be the whole length or will that be uh, one or two sections of it? Uh, no, it will be the whole length, but it won't be the through journey. So eventually uh, it will run from Reading uh, in the west to Sheffield in the east. And when's when's eventually, there. Christian? Uh, probably uh, they're trying to bring that forward. So that might be as early as December this year or else it might be May next year. I see. But what it will do, it will run trains from Paddington through to Abbey Wood, um, so that the whole length of the tunnel underneath London will be open, except for Bond Street. Uh, except, which of course, is, is, is Bagamin. Now, Christian, I think that you owe me a pint of Guinness because I'm pretty sure oh, sure. that we oh, had yeah. a bet that it would be open by March, and I said it wouldn't, and I think we had a pint of Guinness. I'll have another pint of Guinness with you, Christian, the, the whole length of it is not open by Christmas this year. Will you accept oh, my no, bet? Oh, God. You're gonna, it's going to be an expensive time for me in the pub, I suspect. <laughs> but, but, you know, joking apart, Richard, and I think you're quite keen on it as well, by the sound of it. I it am. is something very exciting for London. You know, God, we live in difficult times. You know, COVID, Ukraine, all the rest of it. Um, and this is something, you know, I wrote a piece of the Evening Standard, and they said, oh, no, no, it's too negative. We want a really positive piece. So I rewrote the piece completely positively. And I, I'm really glad they made me do that. Because, you know, yes, there's all sorts of bad news about cost overruns and yeah. all that. But at the end of the day, London is getting a world-class railway. Brilliant. Well, Christian, it sounds like what you're saying is basically it's going to be well worth waiting for. And I am an optimist. I, I do want to, I believe in it. Look, I, I would like to see if we could have Crossrail too, but I just think we need to get Crossrail 1 open and we need to invest uh, a lot of infrastructure spending uh, up in the north of England. Um, Christian Woolmar, thank you so much for that heads up. Well, um, let's not hold our breath, but let's just hope. Uh, he's saying it might. some of it might be open just after Easter. Uh, anyway, we're going to go quickly to Lenny in Ashford. Hello, Lenny. Good, uh, good afternoon, Richard. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, well, I was a Brexiteer because I was concerned of the mentality of the way the EU was going. And I truly believe that this problem we've got with the Ukraine is a lot of it can be... I look at it that the EU, because of their mentality, that... They have got to hold a lot of the responsibility for the situation we're in. Because uh, and why is that? I mean, it's not. It's not as a, it, whatever I think of the EU, and and uh, I hope you're still a Brexiteer, Lenny. But it's um, it's not as though the EU have uh, 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 are actually the aggressors with tanks and things. I mean, it's all Putin, isn't it? Well, you've got to look at the future, Richard. And the EU want to have their own army. And that is one of the things that I was very concerned about, the EU in charge of, a lot of their own army. Agreed. And, you know, and that was it. And I think Putin would have looked at the same thing. And he's looking at the future for Russia, whether we like it or not. And, and I truly believe that if the negotiations have gone right, to stop it, this all happening, instead of uh, the, the Ukrainians like negotiating with Europe, 
they should have negotiated with us and became our trading partner because we got the same population roughly and I think we are two different types, one to uh, a positive, one to negative, and we could have worked very well together. Yeah, no, I, I understand where you're coming from, Lenny, uh, but I think the point is... Putin, it's, it's one thing if he's concerned about something, it's one thing building up your defences and modernising them. It's a completely different thing to say, actually, I'm going to invade another sovereign nation and cause death and destruction on a colossal scale that we haven't seen for 70 plus years. Yeah, but I think that what started it, when the Ukraine was getting closer to Europe and was and starting to negotiate to be part of them, that was the last thing he wanted. Yeah, well, well it's, I, it's, it's, it, he, he might not have wanted it, but it's a whole different ball game to say, I'm going to invade you and kill you. Um, Lenny, well, uh, um, thank you very much. I'm going to have to get, uh, head to the break, but uh, thank you very much, Lenny, for your thoughts. He there being concerned that actually uh, maybe EU expansion has been part of the trigger for this. Anyway, we'll take a quick break. Uh, give us a call, 0344 499 1000. It's Ty's Talk here at Talk Radio. Talk. Bold talk. talk radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
Radio. A new lineup for a new generation. Essential, edgy, engaging. Advanced postulation for any angry nation. Ask for it by name. Talk Radio. The home of common sense. Welcome back to Tice Talk. It's been a full-on show, a full-on three hours, but we've still got time for a few calls and we've got just a few messages here. Uh, interesting one from Chris in Ottershaw who says, I worked on percussion drilling rigs for Thames Water over 40 years ago and we would drill through the water table and seal it off, containing the water from inside the pipes. No doubt they've improved technology since then, Chris. I'm quite sure you're right. Kevin in the West Midlands. Hi there, good afternoon. What would you quickly like to share with us all? Yes, thanks for taking my call, Richard. Uh, yeah, um, there was a professor that done a uh, research uh, uh, field or whatever on the basis of hydrogen production. Currently, at night, a lot of the wind farms produce so much electricity, we don't use it. But we could use that using um, electrolysis to produce hydrogen. And he believes it would pre- we would be able to mix 20% hydrogen with our gas supply. Uh, and I think he's I think he's quite right, actually, uh, Kevin. That's that's my understanding too. But obviously, I, I think the technology is still a, f- a fair bit to go. Well, I, I, I've got to be honest. Electrolysis is well on its way. I mean, the biggest problem for electrolysis is how you get your electricity. Yes. Because obviously, obviously, it's normally done from a from a, a, a coal fire or nuclear or wherever it is. But if you're getting it from, from wind power at night, uh, then really the, the electrolysis is... is, is no, great. that's, that, that, great that's all I'm saying. The, the question is the, the reliability of the supply of the wind power. Um, but I, yeah, that's, yes, that's one of the future opportunities without question, Kevin. Yes, absolutely. But I, I genuinely believe that they should be doing it. And, and the professor reckons that it would be like taking 2.3 million cars off the road if, if this well, was done. That's the opportunity to keep investing. Kevin, thank you so much for that. We're going to head uh, quickly to uh, Leicester, uh, also sort of not far from the West Midlands, where we've got Peter. Hi, Peter. Good afternoon, Richard. What would you like to share with us? Good afternoon to you. Right. Very quickly, whenever the the price of uh, a barrel of oil goes up, 2008, Putin moved into Georgia. 2014, they moved into Crimea, same thing, and to today. But America and Europe, especially us, don't want to sanction the oil they're buying. Over a billion dollars a day they're paying Putin at the moment, and that is funding like before, is uh, is expansion with the army into other places. But unless we cut the oil off, because we, but we are buying gas, oil, and coal from Russia because the city greens inside the Atlantic have just got no idea of, the, of what we, this country needs at this present time. Fine, no ideas for the future for saving oil and, and coal and everything. Fine, but it's not practical nor applicable for now. We and, 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 need them to stop and to us to... There's oil off the Shetlands, there's, there's shale hole in uh, England... And there's more in the North Sea. And the, the madness, obviously. Peter, the madness of all of this is that actually bringing in uh, gas from, whether it's from Russia or it's from the Middle East, involves creating far more CO2 to liquefy it and then to re-vaporise it. I mean, like, well over 60% more CO2 than using our own gas from the North Sea or shale gas. Exactly. Well, it's, it's virtual signalling again. We, 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 do, we do outside the country because we need it, but we're not doing it, so we're green. I mean, it's it's nonsense. Well, it's nonsense, and, 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 and Peter, the danger is we're actually sending our jobs and our money to dictators like Putin or people in the Middle East. Yes, and I've heard from my friends in America because the uh, Biden administration is very green, and they want a high price on oil because it will push people to EV cars. Well, and of course, but of course... Uh, the truth is, at the moment, we in the UK are having to sp- send our money to uh, to Biden and the US uh, in order to buy their fracked gas. Uh, Peter, thank you so much. Keep up yeah. the, the listening and support. I'm just going to take one more call before we approach the top of the hour. We're heading back south to Maidstone, where Rosemary is patiently waiting. Hi, Rosemary. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to be able to speak with you. Um, I've just been thinking about this thing with Putin. I do not think he would consent to a world government, which, uh, unless he was in charge, of course. Um, Unfortunately, most people seem oblivious to what is going on in the world and the new world order. 
Um, they don't know. They've not heard of Klaus Schwab, who who's German. They haven't heard of Soros, who's Hungarian. Um, and the Liberal Democrats, the Clinton, the Obamas, Bidens, they're all sort of, and Trudeau and Erdogan, they all seem to be tied up in this. Um, and nobody seems to realise what's going on. OK, you're, you're talking about sort of, uh, they're all part of what I call the, the DeVos set. Yes. Because uh, I, the World Economic Forum and all of that. Yes, well, Putin would never consent to being um, a world government of any well, sort. Well, but surely, Rose, we, we don't want a world government. I mean, I want independent, sovereign governments running their own countries. Quite, but people don't know about it. This is the problem. I often speak to people. I mean, I'm pretty ancient. I was born in 39, um, lived through the world, Second World War. And, um, you know, but they don't seem to know. I mean, two years ago, in, in, in uh, April next month, um, I was talking to my son and I said, there's something sinister going on. Just got this gut instinct. Yeah, so, so you, you, you had that concern all that time ago when actually, well, it sounds like you were, uh, you were ahead of, uh, of, of many. But, you know, fundamentally, we want uh, individual democratically elected uh, governments and leaders to be responsible to their own people. Yes, yes. But that, I think, I mean, the way the world's going is frightening. It's pretty frightening. Rosemary, thank you so much for your thoughts this Sunday afternoon. Uh, there's Rosemary. She's concerned about are we heading towards a world order? Well, it's been a full on show. We've obviously caught up with the latest in Ukraine. Uh, we're having that discussion, that open national debate about net zero, about shale gas, the treasure under our feet. But talking of treasure, <laughs> it's just walked into the room. Oh, the treasure of Bob Mills. Good afternoon bless to you. Bless your heart, Rishi. What a cracking show. It's fascinating, isn't it, all the talk of... Uh... The, the, the gas, the shale gas and all that. And you, you're quite right, America now is so, pretty much self-sufficient, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, what's on your show then, Bob? Oh, what a show. Uh, well, we're starting with Robert Edrich, a wonderful author who's written a little sort of uh, mini uh, biography of his time growing up in Sheffield. Mark Thomas, the last of the true, real left-wing comics. Right. A dear old friend of mine, he's coming in. Uh, and we're finishing with ceramic art and live music. So. Fantastic. Uh, all to play for this afternoon with Bob Mills. My production team have been wonderful. Thanks for keeping me on the straight and no thanks for listening. Same time, same place next week. You've been listening to Ty's Talk here at Talk Radio. Talk. Bold talk. talk Radio. Listen on your smart speaker. Watch it live on your smart TV. The world headquarters of common sense. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrible. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.